1904, Dr. Seuss, which is actually pronounced Seuss, a fictitious name for Theodore Seuss Geisel, was a highly idiosyncratic writer and illustrator of popular books, written for the likes of children. However, a deeper meaning lies underneath the cartoonish veneer of the star belly Sneech with a sneer on the beach. Some see his stories for what they are, a tool for the enlightenment of mankind. His body of work, besides the books and unusual creatures, consists of advertisements, propaganda posters, military training films, commercial films and paintings. There were works of good and some of bad, a few that Seuss tried to wipe from the face of the earth. Here we will go through the political, the dark and the odd meanings behind the formative work of Dr. Seuss. During the beginning years of World War II, Seuss focused on political cartoons, creating over 400 in two years at a New York Daily newspaper. His work consisted of pro-American, anti-foreign and highly critical cartoons centered around war and making these foreign leaders and their military appear a certain way through symbolism and metaphors. He made Hitler into many characters from a wolf to a mermaid, a chef to a taxidermist, and often displayed other leaders like Benito Mussolini as a bumbling idiot who had no idea what he was doing. Seuss later found himself working side by side with Marvel's Stan Lee, sketching pamphlets that warned soldiers about venereal diseases they could catch while abroad. Seuss also worked with Chuck Jones, the director behind Looney Tunes cartoons. He, Chuck and a team created propaganda videos for American soldiers. Of these videos, the Private Snafu series, raunchy educational cartoons, became the most famous. Seuss drew political cartoons in support of Japanese internment camps, encouraging people to buy war bonds and slap a Japs, smile off his face. Seuss believed, if we want to win, we've got to kill the Japs. In 1945, Seuss wrote, Your Job in Germany, a short film warning the American GI of the inherently diseased German mind, quoting that every German from doctors to clockmakers, from cooks to dock workers, were all part of the Nazi network. Every German is a potential source of trouble, he quotes, and explains how the Americans should not clasp the German hand. It is not the kind you can clasp in friendship. This short film was remade into the Academy Award-winning short, Hitler Lives, of the same concept. The same year, Seuss wrote, our job in Japan, shortly after the end of World War II, the film was aimed toward American troops heading to Japan to participate in the Allied occupation and presents the dilemma of turning the military state into a peaceful democracy. Seuss wrote, we're here to make it clear to the Japanese that we are not the kind of people who forget such things overnight. And that, our job in Japan, is to make it clear to the Japanese that their time has now come to make sense modern, civilized sense. This short film led to the Academy Award-winning film Designed for Death, written by Seuss, and released in 1947. It features hundreds of reels, dramas, and propaganda films, aimed to help the U.S. understand the nation against whom they fought, and how Japanese culture and religion was used to push Japan into an aggressive position of World War II. The film clearly emphasizes American superiority over Japan, Producers hired Hans Conried to imitate the Japanese accent even when Japanese voice actors were available. Seuss said in his memoir that he believed all copies had been destroyed, though at least one is stored in the Library of Congress. After the late 40s, Seuss repurposed his work to utilize the personification displayed in his 1940 book called Horton Hatches, The Egg. In that book, he gave an elephant and a bird human-like qualities in order to display a message symbolizing loyalty and betrayal. In 1958, he wrote a similar book named Yertle the Turtle. King Yertle was a turtle who decided that he wasn't happy with the size of his kingdom, despite the pond being perfect. It was clean, it was neat, and the water was warm. Yertle commanded turtle after turtle to stand on top of one another so that he could see further and declare more as his kingdom. I'm Yertle the Turtle, Oh, marvelous me, for I am the ruler of all that I see. But at the bottom, the turtles became tired and ultimately toppled over, sending the king into the pond. It is said that many connections throughout the book are a thinly veiled allegory for the rise and fall of Adolf Hitler in Germany. As he rose, those at the bottom were overtaken so that Hitler could have more and more power. When the crucial components of his rule started to crumble, Hitler fell very quickly and was left void of all power. 
The 1953 book named The Sneetches was said to be written by Seuss with many undertones of opposition to anti-Semitism, along with opposition to racial and religious bigotry. The story starts with yellow, bird-like creatures known as Sneetches. Some have green stars on their stomachs and some are without. The Sneetches with the stars brag that they are the best Sneetches on the beaches and want nothing to do with the plain belly Sneetches. A man named McBean comes to town with a machine called a Star on Machine that can give the plain belly Sneetches stars for only three dollars. The Star belly Sneetches get angry and McBean offers them service from the Star off Machine for ten dollars. Eventually they cannot distinguish the original Star belly Sneetches from the plain belly Sneetches until neither the plain nor the Star bellies knew whether this one was that one or that one was this one, or which one was what one or what one was who. This story was rumored to be inspired by the yellow star of David that Jews were required to wear on their clothes in order to identify themselves to the Nazis. That day they decided that snitches are snitches, and no kind of snitch is the best on the beaches. Fast forward a year later in 1954, Seuss writes, Horton hears a who, focusing on the powerless. After Seuss visited Japan in 1953 and viewed the damage of the atomic bombs, he changed his views toward the Japanese and dedicated the book to his Japanese friend Mitsugi Nakamura, whom he met on a post-war trip to Kyoto. In the book Horton, an elephant, uses his good hearing to listen to calls of help from a very small community of persons named Hoos in their city of Whoville. None of the other animals believe him because they don't have good enough hearing to hear the voices. They tell him to leave it alone, but Horton refuses to conform. The book is famous for the quote, A person's a person, no matter how small. A struggle that Dr. Seuss faced in his lifetime was fascism, where conformity was a political requisite. Should I put this speck down? Horton thought with alarm. If I do, these small persons may come to great harm. This quote symbolizes the change in Seuss's views. At the time, Japan was a small country in need of support after World War II and may have needed a larger country to help. A couple decades later, in 1971, Seuss returned to his political ways when he released The Lorax to the public. The book is a polemic against pollution during the 1970s start of the environmental movement. It represents the ecosystems and the interrelatedness of all parts as a viable functioning team. In the story, a creature named the Wansler creates a business cutting down truffula trees. In order to grow his businesses, he decides to cut down all of the truffula trees for more profit, causing all of the animals in the ecosystem to no longer be able to function. The Lorax tries to reason with the once lur. I am the Lorax. I speak for the trees. I speak for the trees, for the trees have no tongues. The once lur insults the Lorax and continues until eventually all animals are forced to leave. The once lair is a symbol of corporate greed and consumerism, where only business and money matter. The Lorax represents the voices of those who fight for the environment, small voices that may not be enough. The message in the story is to show the reality of what happens when consumerism wins and how the realization will come too late, as the once lair felt bad about his work in the end. His last political-themed book encompassed the back-and-forth geopolitical tension between the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Seuss wrote The Butter Battle Book, which was a symbolic anti-war story focused around the arms race and nuclear weapons. The Yooks and the Zooks have a conflict with each other over which side of the bread should be buttered. Both sides are constantly trying to build better weaponry to scare or threaten one another. The book's message is that the arms race could be avoided if the trivial misunderstanding of which side of bread is to be buttered could just be let go. In the end, a zook and a yook come face to face holding a small bomb, symbolizing the nuclear bomb, threatening each other over who will drop it first. Then the book ends because that is where we are today, constantly holding the threat of mass destruction over one another. Maybe in the near future, us yooks and zooks of the real world can live in peace. Although Dr. Seuss's books commonly contained anti-fascist and anti-racist themes, they also commonly utilized racial stereotypes when depicting non-white individuals. Throughout his extended career were many examples of this. Seuss had been hired during the Second World War to create anti-Japanese propaganda cartoons emphasizing Japanese stereotypes in order to separate them from American likeness. He gave them squinted eyes, 
Hitler-like moustaches and big, overly extended grins on their faces. When Seuss was contracted by the US government to produce educational cartoons for the troops, he was given a full artistic license allowing him to create whatever he pleased. He created highly stereotypical advertisements for a pesticide company named Flit, and these ads weren't politically correct at all. These ads often featured big-lipped, black-skinned characters acting like savages. In one example, a group of black-skinned cannibals were saved by a flit-carrying European, who was about to become lunch. In the 1937 book, And to Think I Saw It on Mulberry Street, Seuss drew a stereotypical caricature of a Chinese person and labelled him as Chinaman. Then he refused to change it until 1978, 41 years later. Also, a European man is shown holding a whip above a man of colour. In If I Ran the Zoo, release in 1950, two men from Africa wear grass skirts without shirts or shoes, and a white boy holds a large gun while standing on the heads of three Asian men. In 2021, Dr. Seuss Enterprises stopped the publishing and licensing of these two books, as well as four other books that may portray people in ways that are wrong. Dr. Seuss had a strange path leading to children's books, but his first intentions were even stranger. He was obsessed with creating erotic books as he believed he was best suited for the art of erotic storytelling. But his erotic books never did well. He first dabbled in erotica when he contributed art to The Bedroom Companion, a comic showing a lonely, lust-filled woman stuck on an island with a young boy. The young boy protests, Is it my fault I'm only 13? His first ever actual book in 1931 was called The Pocket Book of Boners. In his defense, the word boner has more than one definition which does not focus around the male anatomy. A boner in his sense is an error, and the book was just incorrect answers to questions given by children. The book had many adult jokes and illustrations. When a northern soldier could not go to the Civil War, one child asserts in it, he sent a prostitute. Seuss wrote two more sequels, more boners and still more boners. When Seuss joined Random House Publishing in 1939, he demanded that he be able to publish an adult book that he had already finished. This book was called The Seven Lady Godivers and was a failure only selling 2,500 copies. Each page contained the naked body of one of the seven ladies. Seuss had also tried to weasel the word contraceptive into his 1963 book Hop on Pop. When I read I am smart, I always cut whole words apart. Constantinople, Timbuktu, contraceptive, kangaroo. Very odd, seeing that the word had no purpose in the story. Who knows what kind of catalogue Seuss would have had if the Lady Godivers would have been a success. In Life magazine, Dr. Seuss stated that there's an inherent moral in any story. Throughout his career, he was able to shadow the imperative lessons of history behind rhymes and funny-looking cartoon figures. He went from advocating for Americans to advocating for all, from advocating for war, to advocating for peace. In 1990, one year before his death, he wrote his last book titled, Oh, the Places You'll Go. With him now gone and his work finished, we can look at the deeper meaning behind his catalog and better understand the places he's been. You have brains in your head. You have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself any direction you choose. You're on your own. And you know what you know and you are the one who'll decide where to go. Dr. Seuss.